we understand complex phenomena? How can we understand say, some of the things that are up here? Um, the formation of galaxies, how cells work, uh, how real gravity works. How do we understand that? Well, we can start with a mathematical model that we have to solve. We have to have an understanding of the process. Uh, and I, I promise this is the only equation that I will put up. Um, <laughs> And I put it up because it's actually a pretty simple equation. Uh, you might want to quibble a little bit about it, but you, all you need to get at least a beginning model of, say, how galaxies evolve is this equation. And there are exact solutions for this if you have two particles. Interestingly enough, if you have three, you're on your own. <laughs> There's no way to get an exact solution. So we have to do some sort of approximation. We take our mathematical model, we figure out how to approximate it, and then we have to compute with it. And if something just this simple requires that we compute, clearly we're going to have to use this computation as a way to investigate and understand the consequences of our models. Now, what if I have, say, that galaxy, or say a protein, and I have 100 million particles? How can I figure out what's going to go on? Well, we have built special purpose machines to look at this. Uh, there are machines that know exactly how to simulate with that equation. But they're really just a way to look at one problem. And in fact, one way to do one problem. They'll execute one algorithm or set of instructions to solve a problem. And if someone comes up with a better mathematical model or a better way to solve the problem, then you need to start over and build a new machine. So for a long time, what computer and computational scientists have been doing has been building parallel machines, machines that take a single compute element, and I'll start here up at the top, see what processors used to look like. Now all of your laptops, if they were built in the last couple of years, actually contain several processors. They're already parallel machines. And we have been taking these and putting them together in large groups to try to solve bigger and bigger problems. It's not even a new idea. There uh, is a wonderful diagram in an old textbook about doing a weather modeling simulation, which was a room sort of like this with a director and people with mechanical calculators. And the director would point to people, and they would hand data to their neighbors. A big parallel machine might now look something like this, except that's not really a big parallel machine. In a few years, that will be your laptop. We'll start adding more and more pieces. And in fact, this number of pieces might just be a single slice. We may have thousands of these. And so if we're going to solve a problem using these thousands of computing elements or processors, we need to talk about how we break the problem up into smaller and smaller pieces. So one way to think about this is, um, so I'm teaching. I've got a big class. I have 147 students. I wish I had 147 graders, because then I could give one homework assignment to each grader. They would spend a couple of minutes grading it and give it back to me, and I would be done. <laughs> that's basic parallelism. If you've heard of cloud computing, that's basically the kind of problem that cloud computing is good for. You break it up into a bunch of independent problems that you can hand off to some worker, some processor someplace. It does it and returns it to you or to some coordinator. But a lot of problems in science and engineering, including the evolution of galaxies or the, the flow of fluids, don't have the property that it's independent. So in the case of galaxies, the gravitational effects go everywhere. They might be very small if you're very, very far away, but they go everywhere. In fluid dynamics, the particles are, the, you can think of it as patches of air. They're pushing on neighboring patches. Each of those influences the neighbor. They have to get out of the way. They have to move. And so if you wanted to compute something like this, so in here is a tornado. So we're trying to understand how the tornado forms, where it might go. Uh, can we predict better when it will form? Can we predict better how to construct structures to survive them? We can think of this as having lots of little patches of air that we have to follow. So that's a simple parallel computation. Each patch of air has to be followed. There are an awful lot of patches of air. Let's think maybe 
we do a 10 by 10 by 5 kilometer patch. So that's not a very big patch. And if you look at where uh, tornadoes go, that actually won't hold the typical path length. But even if we do that, and we have, say, one centimeter patches of air, which is a pretty big patch of air, we have 500 million billion patches of air. And we have to compute all of those. And say I took a single laptop, and I used it to compute each of those patches of air, and I wanted to do this uh, for, say, a few minutes or a few hours to follow what was going on, I would need about 500,000 laptops. And even that wouldn't be good enough because I haven't figured out yet how I would have connected those laptops so they could tell each other that their piece of air had moved from here to here and other pieces had to get out of the way. Now, there's a, there's a set of those SI prefixes. The, we have mega for a million, giga for a billion, tera for a thousand billion, and peta for a million billion, and exa for a billion billion. So this sort of calculation, to really do it well, is really in the billion billion category. Right. That's going to require a huge number of systems. And as I said, they have to communicate. They have to exchange information. They have to coordinate with each other. Remember I said there was that big room with people doing mechanical calculations and handing them to their neighbors. That's what they were doing. They were computing patches of air and how they moved. And then they would hand to their neighbor, my patch moved into your patch. And you're going to have to now take that into account when you do your next computing step. As we start doing this for thousands or millions or hundreds of billions of pieces, <clears throat> we have to arrange for that communication. So this is one of the things that's fundamentally different between the cloud computing, where the parallel operations are very separate, and the sort of exascale or petascale scientific computing, where each computation on a basis of every, say, millisecond has to talk to each other. Now, you might think, okay, now what do we do? I mean, if I'm going to try to understand something this big, I can't just do it on my laptop. I can't put together a couple of million laptops and do this. What can I do? Well, fortunately, we are building systems of this size. So in fact, the National Science Foundation has, over the years, made systems capable of doing this sort of communication, this sort of computation, available to engineers and scientists. They are now funding a system that will uh, go into a building that is near here, and I'm turned around, but it's a couple of blocks from here. That way, thank you. Uh, this machine will be capable of sustaining a million billion operations per second. The, so that's the, the petaflop operation. It will be capable of doing a simulation that follows the development of a tornado or understands how the early galaxies formed. It will be capable of helping us gain this sort of insight into these sort of computations. Now, when you look at one of, uh, what one of these machines uh, looks like, there are lots of challenges in putting them together. So I want to show you, this is the, uh, a node drawer from the machine that will go into that building. And you can see how dense it is. The, the drawer itself is very heavy. But you can also see this copper tubing there. It's actually for water. A lot of power has to go into these things to help to compute. You have to pull the energy out. You actually do that with water. Uh, in Illinois, three quarters of the year, we can cool that water by running it up to the top of the building and just letting it touch the air and come back down. Challenges like this, as we try to make this machine even bigger and faster, are among the biggest challenges that high-end computing is facing. So if we want to go from a machine that sustains a petaflop, which this machine does, to an exaflop, we have to find a way to make this machine a thousand times faster. 
And we can't afford to make it a thousand times bigger or have it consume a thousand times more power. So we have to figure out how to make it a thousand times more efficient in the same amount of space and with almost the same amount of power. This machine itself will have about 300,000 of those processing elements in here uh, up at the uh, top. Each one of those little black boxes has got 32 processing elements. And there will be hundreds of these uh, in that building. And with that, we will be able to answer, or at least gain some insight in some of these questions. As we go forward, looking at computing at the exascale, at 1,000 times this, we're going to find that we're going to need new mathematical methods, new computer science, new ideas in order to reach these levels of efficiency. I believe we'll be able to do that, and it will help us gain insight and answer the sorts of questions that you saw posed at the beginning. And I should say, those questions are actually titles or drawn from titles of projects which have already been approved to run this machine. So right now, taking advantage of this sort of capability, we are going to be able to answer some of these questions or gain insight in how to answer them for the next generation of machines. Thank you. Actually, would you mind telling us in, uh, in about that minute or so a few words about the Blue Waters uh, project? I think it's something that's uh, very interesting that our audience would, would like okay, to hear. So, so I've, um, I've mentioned this machine. It's part of what's called the Blue Waters Project. As I mentioned, the National Science Foundation is funding a machine to establish a petascale, sustained petascale computing facility in that building. 80% um, of that time is being uh, managed by the National Science Foundation. People make proposals for it. About 20% of the time will be managed through the University of Illinois. Um, and we will use that, particularly as seed uh, time, for people to, under, to gain insight and to understand how to make use of big machines like this. So one of the things that I, I'd like you to get out of you know, the Blue Waters part of this is that we can use computing to solve that, and the resources are here. Um, the machine, there are the machines that are available for doing this, and um, a machine like Blue Waters that combines both these hundreds of thousands of processors, um, vast amounts of data space, so we will have half an exabyte, so that's the billion, billion uh, bytes of storage to help us attack problems that are not just compute intensive, but data intensive. Thank <laughs> you.